local developments attract the attention of the neighbors, particularly of the so Differences of a might be settled in a meeting at Chia. Will it succeed? Czechoslovak party leader Dubček meets Soviet party boss Brezhnev. Apparently the negotiations are not simple and they are constantly being extended. The small railway station in eastern Slovakia becomes a center of the world's interest. The talks last for four days and information is scarce, but the chatives can count on the support of the whole nation. Finally, an agreement. It ends with smiles and a fraternal embrace. This is the first day of August, 1968. Two days later in Bratislava, a common declaration is formally signed by six socialist states, members of the Warsaw Pact, with Romania absent, as usual. The principles of equality, sovereignty, national independence, territorial integrity and fraternal cooperation are reaffirmed. It would appear that everything is all right, but is it? The following week, the president of Yugoslavia, Marshal Tito, visits Prague. He gets a hero's welcome. Twelfth of August, East German leader Walter Ulbricht comes unexpectedly to Karlovy Vary. He offers his rich experience, for according to his own words, he represents one of the most stable socialist countries. On the 15th of August, the long-expected visit of the Romanian leader, Nicolaou Ceausescu, takes place. This statesman's efforts towards an independent policy within the Warsaw Pact gain an extraordinary amount of sympathy in Czechoslovakia. After his departure, a few quiet days. Now it is time to prepare the extraordinary party congress which should permanently ratify the recent Czechoslovak economic and social reforms. But there is another unexpected visit. It occurs at dawn of the 21st of August, 1968. Radio Prague is on the air throughout the night, broadcasting a special announcement of the Presidium of Czechoslovak Communist Party. To all people of the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, yesterday at 11 p.m., the armed forces of the Soviet Union, Polish People's Republic, German Democratic Republic, Hungarian People's Republic, and the Bulgarian People's Republic have crossed the borders of the Czechoslovakian Socialist Republic. This happened without the knowledge of the President of the Republic, Chairman of the National Assembly, Prime Minister, First Secretary of the Party, as well as the organizations they represent. The central building of Radio Prague is still in the hands of the government. It was here that in May 1945, the Czech patriots fought the Nazis for the control of free broadcasting. Now again, tanks are approaching. Their aim is clear. It is also clear to these people. But perhaps this is a misunderstanding. Perhaps it might be explained. What is there to conquer here with tanks? Not a single shot has been fired here since the beginning of the Czechoslovak liberal reforms. There is not and never has been any counter-revolution. Can these soldiers understand this? A 
against the overwhelming force which at this moment is about to crush our country we have only our truth all we are guilty of is our longing to create a socialist system of our own a socialism with a human face why do they try to stop us what are they trying to make of us shall we become be it only for a moment the mouse that roared Prague airport was occupied by paratroopers shortly after midnight. Soviet cargo planes continued bringing in a heavy battle equipment. The recently completed international airport was having its premiere in the style of Franz Kafka. The building of the Central Committee of the Party, 8 a.m. Soon after midnight, a black Volga limousine of the Soviet embassy led the first detachment of paratroopers to this building. By then, the party secretary Dubček, the chairman of the National Assembly Smrkovsky, Prime Minister Cherenink, and other leaders had already been detained by the Soviet Secret Service. Troops are still coming, occupying all important points, blocking all main arteries. Step by step, all life of the city is being crippled. But why? Of course, discussions lead nowhere. Still, the soldiers are beginning to realize that there is a discrepancy between what they are hearing and seeing for themselves and the propaganda they have been fed. There is a shade of disappointment on the Russian faces. Why don't these people welcome us as their protectors? But the army is not trained to be a debating society. The army is there to obey orders. There is a cliché about fighting tanks with bare hands. This is what it looks like in real life.
This certainly looks like war. It is a strange war, though. In war, you must have two opposing sides. But these soldiers are threatened by no one. No one fires at them. In fact, it is not referred to as war. In Soviet terminology, it is called fraternal aid. first injuries and deaths caused by the explosion of a burning ammunition truck. Young people were quick to minimize the danger. A short survey of the battlefield and reinforcements are sent. Against whom? Casting center has actually been occupied, but not silenced. At this very moment, broadcasting resumes from many other points. Slowly at first, and still only half believing, people begin to comprehend that perhaps this was no misunderstanding after all. They remember that once again, as so many times before in history, they will not be allowed to decide their own country's destiny. is an ancient city with many narrow medieval streets where parking problems abound. A small Volkswagen is the ideal means of transportation. A tank, of course, enjoys the advantage of being able to blaze its own path. Through these streets, the tanks passed to the National Assembly. Here again, they came in order to protect the plenary session of the highest legislative body of Czechoslovakia is scheduled for today. But the entrance is blocked and the chairman's office is empty. The representatives are informed that their chairman has been arrested and taken to an undisclosed place. But 
the will of the people is clear. We protest the shameful occupation. At noon, a two-minute protest strike is scheduled. The sound of automobile horns makes the occupying forces slightly nervous. Some of them prefer to disappear behind their smoke screen. Perhaps they are beginning to understand why they are not offered flowers for their fraternal aid. The noon strike at the monument of King Wenceslas, the patron saint of Bohemia, who a thousand years ago was murdered by his own brother. But the city is still alive. Special editions of all regular newspapers are published, and the national radio and television supporting the government are on the air. New supply convoys arrive, partly consisting of civilian trucks that were commandeered by the occupying forces. Never before in its thousand-year history has Prague been so overrun with heavy war equipment. Whom did these warriors come to fight? Peace has been brought also to the area surrounding the broadcasting center. These pictures were taken by a substitute cameraman. His predecessor, who worked at the spot during the morning, is lying here. The National Assembly issues a proclamation that the occupation of Czechoslovakia by the five Warsaw Pact armies constitutes a breach of international law. It demands the immediate release of all leading politicians from confinement and protests its being prevented from exercising its legislative duties. We categorically demand the immediate withdrawal of the armies of the five Warsaw Pact states and the complete respect of Czechoslovakia's national sovereignty. We turn to the parliaments of all countries and to the world public opinion to support our legal demands. All day and all night, new troops keep arriving. Within 48 hours, more than half a million soldiers occupy tiny Czechoslovakia. Any military resistance is futile from the very beginning. In the small towns of northern Bohemia, soldiers are stopped by citizens who try to reason with them. For 23 years, the youth of this country was taught to love the Soviet Union as the greatest protector of peace and the guarantor of our independence. They were taught the Russian alphabet but nobody ever imagined what form the practical use of this knowledge would take. <laughs> Nevertheless, neither the perfect inscription, free of spelling mistakes, nor the eloquent oratory can stop this modern, efficient war machine.
In some places, people attempted to stop tanks by means of barricades. It did not help for long. Still, barricades made of burning tires proved the most effective. This tank came here in 1945 during the liberation from the Nazi rule. Now it was used as a pitiful barricade. The military transports have not yet reached southern Bohemia. Special editions of South Bohemian Pravda bring the latest news. They evoke general interest. Like everywhere else, they are avidly read. Furthermore, newspapers are free of charge today. This is how the town of Ceske Budejovice looked on the second day of occupation. The slogan of the day, do not touch a single hair on the heads of the occupying troops and don't give them a single glass of water. The landings at Budjevice airport are controlled by the Soviet flight technicians. The Czechoslovak technicians, just as everywhere else, refuse to cooperate. They only watch. Another successful landing. But not all are so fortunate. Looks like these fellows went mushroom picking. If they did, the grateful citizens set up free information for their armed guests. There are only a few poisonous mushrooms in Bohemia, but here they are all listed and recommended. The border with neutral Austria is still quiet. The checking is in the hands of Czechoslovak authorities and the traffic is unimpaired so far. Many Czech tourists are returning full of doubts and fears. Many others are leaving in a hurry, maybe forever. Even the appearance of South Bohemian towns, unchanged for centuries, is marked by the events of these days. The column of the Holy Virgin, witness to medieval suffering. And here, a witness to suffering in modern times. This place is forever inscribed in the conscience of the world. The village of Lidice has known the true meaning of the word occupation. The mothers of Lidice appeal to the foreign soldiers. Do not kill us and our children. The spirits in Prague still high. It is reported that the president is holding talks about the situation with those members of the constitutional government who are still free. The Hyde Park of Prague at the monument of King Wenceslas. The popular Olympic champion Emil Zatopek appeals to the sportsmen of the world not to allow the countries involved in the aggression against Czechoslovakia to participate in the Olympics. The Czech hippies reject violence and turn to the foreign troops with an urgent plea. We don't need you soldiers. Please go home.
ale nakonec ti na to doplatili všichni životem. Prague is encircled in an iron ring. The entrance to the broadcasting center is impenetrably sealed. The antennas of Cheteka are dead, but television and radio are on the air. An appeal is issued to the delegates elect of the 14th Party Congress to open the plenary session in Prague immediately. It is easy for Soviet propaganda to accuse Dubček and other leaders of counter-revolutionary activity, but it would be much more difficult to level this charge at hundreds of delegates representing the most body of the Communist Party. Téměř tisíc delegátů z celé republiky zahájilo dnes v 11 hodin 18 minut v Praze mimořádný 14. sjezd komunistické strany Československa. Ze slovenských krajů se do Prahy dostalo individuálně zatím pět soudruhů, ostatní delegáti vedení náměstky předsedy vlády doktorem Husákem a doktorem Sou byli zadrny okupačními jednotkami u Břeclavy. Ve chvíli, kdy se delegáti scházeli, vydal velitel okupačních sil v Praze zákaz veřejných schromáždění. Jest přesto snání zahájil a je tedy, pardon, a je tedy v těchto chvílích nejvyšším stranickým... By the decision of Congress, all comrades arrested by the occupying forces are elected to the new leadership of the party. The occupation is strongly condemned and an appeal for immediate restoration of Czechoslovak sovereignty is proclaimed. Best representatives of the Soviet Union. Turn is expected the same day. The central building of the Czechoslovak State Bank is being occupied. Tension increases. Nerves are on edge. No more discussions. More incidents arise between the citizens and the foreign troops. The outcome, of course, is inevitable. The negotiations by the legal representatives of the state must be supported to express the unanimous stand of the whole nation. A one-hour gent right is scheduled for noon today. This is what it looks like at the Kladno Steel Works, which up to this morning bore the name of Marshal Konev. The workers decided that while they still honor the memory of the liberators of Prague, their factory can no longer bear the name of the Marshal of the Occupation Army. Similar scenes can be observed in Kladno coal mines and in industrial works all over the Republic. The only activity of the moment, returning membership cards of the Czechoslovak Soviet Friendship Union. In the city, an appeal is circulated during the strike, leave the occupying troops alone in the streets. There is more graffiti done in the Russian alphabet.
the power of arguments against the arguments of power. A popular plebiscite. Signs for Dubček in all sizes. The most concise political program. Long live Svoboda. Referring both to the president and to the meaning of his name in Czech. Freedom. The people tremble over the fate of their country. How many times already in this century? And how far can the anguished cry of the whole nation be heard? The twilight of the third exhausting day falls. The president has not yet returned. The state of occupation continues. At times it even seems that the armies are preparing to prolong their temporary stay. In some places, the occupying troops are checking cars, conducting personal searches, confiscating newspapers, cameras, transistor radios. A flurry of activity at the East German Embassy. Their troops are again taking part in an aggression against Czechoslovakia. But the Prague hippies issue an appeal. Boys and girls increase the sexual tension of the intruders. More responsible citizens see to it that better information is passed on to the troops. A Russian Pravda is distributed among them, printed on Czech presses. It interprets the actual events in a somewhat different manner from that of the Moscow newspaper of the same name. The distribution of leaflets by the occupying forces is of course more comfortable. They come by airmail. But the result, in spite of all the effort, is negligible. For what is the truth? Here's a Soviet cameraman covering the Czechoslovak counter-revolution from inside an armored car. These pictures can really prove the extraordinary situation in Prague. But will his commentary mention what it has been caused by? And here, the ultimate crime. At the moment of highest emergency, betrayed and attacked by its former friends, the people take a desperate step. Spontaneous action proclaiming the neutrality of Czechoslovakia. The UN is being asked for help. But the UN is far away, the Soviet tanks much closer. This one guards a building of the highest importance, the headquarters of the state secret police. Nobody knows what's happening inside. But in spite of all the dark memories associated with this institution, only a few of its members cooperate with the intruders. The time of quizlings seems to be coming. But so far they have no power. Perhaps they have already missed their chance. But will it be their last one? Life in the city goes on. 
There are troubles with supplies, but people manage. Basic food is available, even though you must line up for it. The most essential cue is for transistor radio batteries. No matter how fantastic it might seem, up to now the invaders have not been able to put an end to the legal Czechoslovak radio. But for how much longer? Věnujte prosím pozornost této zprávě. Ve směru od České Třebové se blíží ku Praze vlak okupantů, který je vybaven silnými rušičkami. Železničáři nedovolte, aby legální vysílání Československého rozhlasu bylo rušeno okupanty. Právě jsme dostali zprávu, že vlak okupantů, který veze rozhlasové rušičky do našeho hlavního města, Zůstal stát mezi Pardubicemi a Hradcem Králové. Železničáři, děkujeme vám. As a matter of fact, it took this train two days to travel 50 miles. Finally, they had to switch to the road. Another important message. Extensive arrests are expected tonight. Občané. Odstraňujte ukazovatele se jmény měst a vesnic, názvy obcí a tabule určené k orientaci. V mnoha městech jsou už ulice bez jmen a domy bez čísel. Lidé odstraňují z vlastní iniciativy všechna znamení, která by mohla sloužit k orientaci okupantů. So far, the invaders have been unable to form a new government which would eventually legalize the occupation. The non-stop session of the National Assembly goes on. It refuses to confirm the statement of the occupying authorities that their forces were invited here by high members of the party and the government. The delegates do not leave the building even at night. Soviet guards let no one back in but the delegates are resolved to remain here as long as necessary. The president sends a message from Moscow. Negotiations continue. Dubček, Chernik, Smirkovsky and other comrades who had been arrested are taking part. Keep the peace, rationality, unity. Keep the peace, rationality, unity. Sunday morning in the south of Bohemia. This is traditionally the hour of the Bible, but today the regional party newspaper runs a very successful competition. And what about the much publicized normalization? Yes, nameless streets are given names again. But thousands of streets in Prague, as well as in other towns throughout the country, now bear the same names. Dubček, Svoboda, Černík, Smrkovský. For the information of foreign troops, new road signs are in evidence. Slow, children playing, tanks do not enter. This way to Moscow, Berlin, Warsaw, Budapest, Sofia. Even though during the night when the city is under curfew, soldiers tear down all the leaflets and posters, new ones appear in the streets in the morning. New expressions of folklore spring forth in prose and verse. By late afternoon it is difficult to find space for your own creation. Sunday street cleaning near the broadcasting center.
free broadcasts are still reaching the people. So why this senseless destruction? For the victims from nearby houses, fast and free assistance is organized. The popular Sunday promenade of Prague citizens in the old town square. After a little training, the people no longer seem to notice the foreign soldiers. But the desperate uncertainty continues for the fifth day. People are informed about the sympathies of public opinion the world over. But they are still in the dark about what is happening in Moscow. And what do their leaders there know about the real situation back home? More and more the appeal is heard, stop negotiating home. The sixth day, tanks are still stationed in St. Wenceslas Square. It is time to bury our dead. Were all these sacrifices in vain? It makes no sense to let yourself be provoked. General boycott meets widespread agreement. It seems they are waiting for provocation for an occasion to justify their deeds, at least to themselves. There are things, though, which cannot be ignored nor forgotten. Many foreign correspondents and cameramen are still in the country and continue reporting the events to the world at large. For some of them, this is no doubt sensational news. For the people here, these are bitter days of national tragedy. and only plea addressed to the Czechoslovak leaders in Moscow. Please return home. As if with the touch of a magic wand, the tanks vanished overnight from Prague Castle, from Government House, and from the entire center of the city. The Czechoslovak delegation is returning from Moscow. The guarding of all important buildings is taken over again by the Czechoslovak army and police. This fact alone lifts the spirits of the city. Soon after, an announcement is made to the nation, henceforth to be known as the Moscow Communique. The Soviet representatives, expressing the unequivocal attitude of the nations of the Soviet Union for friendship and brotherhood with the nations of socialist Czechoslovakia, confirm their ability for widespread and sincere cooperation on the ground of mutual respect, equality, territorial integrity, independence, and socialist solidarity. 
the Allied forces who entered temporarily the territory of Czechoslovakia will not intervene in the internal affairs of the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. An agreement has been reached about the withdrawal of these troops from Czechoslovak territory as soon as a normal state of affairs in Czechoslovakia is restored. Perhaps the most critical moment of these seven days has arrived. What will be the people's reaction to the results of the Moscow negotiations? Will they understand that this was no agreement reached by two equal partners? Will they see that even 14 million signatures against this agreement would change nothing? Can they understand that it was their unity and common sense which saved their elected leaders, the greatest asset possessed by the country in its darkest hour? Will the people be able to comprehend this? At the end of the drama, the tireless Emil Zatopek is here again. Myšlení a našich snah našlo o to, abychom tak jako vždycky vytězili dál sílou našeho převahu našeho ducha nad tady touto. And the voice is heard again, which has been most eagerly awaited, the voice of Dubček. Po dobu, když jsem já i druhý sudrovia. Nemohli sa zúčastňovať spolu s nimi na práci našej strany. Vážení poslucháči, prosím, aby ste mi preminuli, ak tu a tam sa prejaví nejaká predstavka i v tejto mojej mnohom improvizovanej reči a improvizovanom vystúpení. Myslím, že ma chápete, čím je to vyzvané. The last of the many meetings of these days takes place in front of the National Assembly building. Is there anything that could be changed now? Voices are heard. Let them shoot us. At least we have that freedom. But the parliament speaker announces that the National Assembly refuses to be bound by the Moscow agreement, which will be the subject of further discussion. The representative of the youth organization issues an appeal for a general plebiscite about the results of the Moscow agreement. With this, the last meeting is adjourned. Prague awakens to just another day. The monument Jan Hus burned at the stake for urging reform of the church a full century before Luther. So another working day begins. 
the streets regain their normal appearance but the marks of what happened remain the national museum a shrine of Czechoslovakia's history Some traces of what happened will stay for a while. Many will remain forever. But the people know this mustn't be the end of the Czechoslovak experiment. Too many basic goals are at stake. Goals that lie far beyond these seven days. Not only law and the truth, but the whole of human society in freedom and social justice. That has been and will remain the aim of all Czech and Slovak striving. Soon the 50th anniversary of Czechoslovak independence is to be celebrated. Its first president, the philosopher and statesman, Thomas Masaryk, wrote, Our question, the Czech question, is either a world question or it is no question at all. May these seven days of August 1968 be witness to this idea.